Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Well, great to see you here. Uh, so good to be with you. My name's Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here. And so it's your very first time. A special welcome, um, whether you're here on our campus, you're joining us online. Uh, we're going to go into our time of teaching in just a minute, but I just have a quick announcement, too. I don't know if you knew this. Uh, well, most people don't. But uh, that uh, ever since COVID, uh, there's been like this drop in volunteerism in our country. Right? So, it's not, so it's like churches across the board, uh, and, uh, parachurch organizations, nonprofits, kind of all struggling uh, to, to have enough volunteers. So it's, it's almost like, hey, we forgot how to do certain things, you know, during COVID. And one of those was volunteer and serve. Now, here at Rocky Peak, we've been blessed with hundreds of amazing volunteers that are serving all of our ministries from like life groups to uh, kind of mentoring ministries, 33 uh, first impressions, uh, uh, student and kids, and so on. Uh, but we're also feeling the we're also feeling the 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 challenge of that. Uh, so, for example, um, you may not know this, but we're we're actually growing as a church. Um, that like last month, just to give you like, is 26 percent larger than a year ago, right? So it's like it's a big like fast growth, um, and. Um, and so uh, all of our ministries across the board are really uh, kind of needing more people to, to step up. Uh, one example we just saw is kids ministry, that uh, kids ministry is actually growing faster than the church. Like last month, um, the, the, our numbers were uh, 30 to 35% larger this year than last year. Uh, which is an amazing thing. Like, I was just bringing us lots of families and lots of kids. Uh, here's the downside of that is we actually have 5% fewer kids' ministry volunteers this year than last year. And so uh, I just want to put out uh, kind of awareness of kind of this big thing going on in our culture since COVID, that this has been a thing. And so I know many of you have found your place to serve here at Rocky Peak, but you know, part of being part of a community is not just consuming, but contributing. And, uh, and so I just want to throw that word in this series about hearing God. And one of the most important areas for to hear God is like, where is he calling you to serve? So every one of us has a different story. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you to be listening, Lord. Some of you are joining, are joining us online. Uh, you still have the COVID effect and you're still at home. Um, <laughs> and just news to you that COVID is over. Well, I know, I know it's still, yeah. But, you know... <laughs> It's sort of over, and it's time for many of you just to come home. Like, we're waiting for you, aren't we? Like, we're waiting for you. Yeah, so we love you. Um, so, hey, just encourage you. And you know, in that kids' ministry, beautiful thing that they, I don't think you mentioned this, but most of our volunteers just serve half time. It's like every other week or twice a month. And so uh, it's a very reasonable commitment. You know, one of the things we want to do is we want to open up Saturday nights again. We've only been able to do it for first through fifth grade. And we've got so many families who would love to come on Saturday night. Uh, for some of them, it's the only night they, they can come to work on Sunday or whatever, but they have younger kids and we just haven't been able to up because we just don't have enough volunteers. And so um, just uh, put that out there that uh, if the Lord is like, calling you uh, or even if he's not calling you, or maybe if he's been calling you but you haven't been picking up the phone, uh, <laughs> that this would be a great time to do that, amen? All right, so hey, let's get, we're going to go into our time of teaching. I'm really looking forward to this time today as we talk about the still, small voice. Let's, let's pray together. So Father, we just thank you that we come into your presence uh, here as a church, that you're here with us, you're here waiting for us, and now you're here ready to speak. And so we just ask that by the power of your spirit, you'd speak to each of us according to uh, our, our need, and that we as a church should be ready to listen and follow. We pray this in your name, and everyone said... Amen. So our story today starts in the middle of the desert, and he's actually been traveling now for over a month. And as he, uh, he rounds the bend, he can see in the distance uh, his final destination. This is where he's been traveling, this, this jagged, rugged mountain that stands out against the, the just stands out brightly against the, the bright blue desert sky. And if you were to pull him aside and ask him why he's come, um, I'm not sure he's, he's able to answer at least not fully, that he, he knows he's drawn, he knows he's supposed to come, but he's not sure exactly what he's hoping to experience, except that a part of him is hoping that, that history will somehow repeat itself, and that here on this mountain, he will get the answers to the questions that are threatening to derail his entire life. 
Well, today we're continuing this series that we've been in now. This is a six week of a 10 week series called Hearing God, Discerning His Voice. And for those of you who are brand new, a special welcome. The, the core concept of this series is very simple that we believe that God is still speaking to His people today in a wide variety of ways. And that, uh, that one of the most critical skills that we need to develop, one of the most powerful experiences we need to, to have is to, uh, if we want to truly develop a personal relationship with God, if we want to experience his presence in power uh, working in us and through us, uh, and if we want to experience his, kind of, kind of fulfill his calling, his vision for our life, that we, that we have to learn how to, to recognize and respond to the voice of God when he speaks to us. And so if you've been here the last couple of weeks, we've been in this kind of mini series within the larger series, we're talking about the many ways that God speaks to us today. And so, so week one of this, two weeks ago, Dre spoke to us and did a great job talking about the primary way that God's gonna speak to us as his children is through his written word, through the Bible, right? Uh, then last week, uh, Joel began to talk about some of the other ways that God speaks. He talked about this, how God speaks through our conscience, how he speaks to what he called through the oughtness. He talked about how God he began to touch on things like spiritual gifts. And then this week in your life group study, we read a chapter from J.P. Moreland's book on miracles where he talks about six different ways God speaks, not only through scripture, but also through dreams and visions and prophetic words and even angelic visits and things like that. But today, as we kind of wrap up this kind of three-week section of how God speaks, we're going to be talking about the, what I believe is the most common and the most important way that God speaks, especially as we grow in our relationship with God uh, outside of his word, and that is through what has traditionally been called the still, small voice. And so what we're going to be doing at today is looking, first of all, where does that term come from? And then what are we talking, when we talk about the still small voice, what are kind of three different ways that would fall under that category of how God speaks to us? So there in your note sheet is a section called uh, Hearing God, the Still Small Voice. And uh, we're going to start, first of all, with, with kind of where this, where this term comes from. So if we go back in time to the time of, in the Old Testament, the time of Elijah, the prophet Elijah, uh, that, that we're, this, this term kind of comes out of a situation in his life. And this takes us back to the story we started the day with. Remember, we started the day with a story of this man who's been on a journey over a month long. He's in the middle of the desert. He comes around a corner. He sees this kind of tall, jagged mountain standing out against the blue desert sky. And he's coming looking for answers to really important questions that are threatening to derail him. And, and this is my version of an account of an incident in the life of Elijah. And so the situation goes like this, that Elijah is a prophet to Israel, and it's a time when Israel has gone off the rails, they're living in apostasy, they're worshiping foreign gods, they've completely broken the covenant that they entered into with God at Mount Sinai 500 years before, that they would be, uh, he would be their God and he would be their people and no other gods. And so in the north, uh, in Israel, the, the king and queen that are ruling are, are one of the most kind of uh, vicious kind of power couples in the Bible, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And because through Jezebel, they've introduced kind of the worship of these foreign gods into the nation. And they're not only doing that, but they're persecuting any of the prophets, killing the prophets of God. Uh, and as far as Elijah knows, he's the last one left. And through a recent uh, series of events, he's been forced to flee from the country to run for his life. And so he is heading back to this, he's heading back to Mount Sinai. It's gonna be over, it's gonna take him 40 days uh, for him to get there. And when he comes, we're not really sure exactly why he comes, but I, I think that in, in my mind, what he's coming for is he's, he's coming to hear from God. That uh, 500 years before, this is where, when God first brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, they brought, he brought them to Mount Sinai, and it was there that God came to them in a mighty display of power. He came with uh, dark clouds, with, um, with uh, a booming kind of you know, huge winds, with uh, uh, the sound of trumpets, so with fire and smoke just looking, make the whole mountain looking like it's on fire and a tremendous earthquake, and out of this awesome display of power, God actually speaks to the nation the Ten Commandments audibly, and his voice is so loud and so powerful, it scares the people to death. And they say, yes, we want to enter into covenant, we want you to be our God, but Moses, can you go up and get the rest of the details, because this, we're going to die, you know? 
And so Moses is gonna go up for uh, two times, 40-day 40, 40 periods at a time, and on the second one of those, he's actually gonna say to God, uh, God, can I just see your glory? And he's gonna have this powerful experience where God actually passes by, lets him have a glimpse of his glory, speaks his name. And so it would seem to me that what, what was happening is Elijah is going back to the place where the story all started 500 years before in the hopes that God would speak to him again, like he spoke to Moses. And sure enough, God is going to speak, but in a very different way. And so we're told on the very first night, that day he arrives there, he climbs the mountain, he finds a cave, and he, he sleeps uh, in the cave. Remember, he's very depressed, he's very discouraged. And in the morning, he wakes up and, and God is speaking to him before he even comes out of the cave. And he's gonna, come, uh, he's gonna call him to come out of the cave. Um, but before he does, he asks him, Elijah, why are you here? And Elijah kind of pours out his heart how discouraged he is. The nation's abandoned you. They're killed all the prophets. So I'm the only one left. And so God is gonna speak. That's the situation that we're, we're looking at here. So the whole story, if you wanna read the entire story of what leads up to this, it's in 1 Kings 17 through 19. It's there in your note sheet, the reference. But we're just gonna look at the one verse that we're focused in on. And so it says that, so God is about to speak to him and he says, uh, he's still in the cave. And he says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. And so just like at Mount Sinai, 500 years before, God is gonna come with this incredible display of power. And I want you to picture that, like how strong a wind does it have to be be shattering rocks? And he says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And, uh, and after the wind... Uh, there was an earthquake, just like 500 years before. Uh, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake came a fire, just like 500 years before. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came what? Okay, so on your line now. We're going to come back to it. So after the fire uh, comes a gentle whisper. Not God speaking out loud from the heavens, but, but a gentle whisper. And so when Elijah hears this whisper, he pulls his cloak over his face, probably to protect him from seeing God. He might die. He pulls his face over, uh, cloak over the face, and he went out, and he stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And at this point, Elijah's going to pour out his heart again, and God's going to speak to him and recommission him. And if we had time, we'd go into that. We don't have time for that. But what I want to focus on today is this little phrase that the New International Version translated, God spoke to him in a gentle whisper. Now, this is actually, uh, in the Hebrew, a very hard, um, a very hard phrase to um, translate. In fact, if you were to, to do, look at commentaries with Hebrew scholars, uh, if you were to even look at different translations of the Bible, you would see that different translations diff translate this differently. Like, let me give you a couple examples. Like, here's what, how one Hebrew scholar described this. He said, he described it, uh, the, the still small voice, uh, this gentle whisper, he, he describes it as a faint whisper. Another scholar describes it like this, a voice, quiet, hush, and low. The New American Standard Bible, if you were to look it up, it describes it as the sound of gentle blowing. But if you were to go back to the King James Version, which was, remember, was translated in 1611, uh, and, for, and for the church was the primary version for hundreds of years, this is how the, the New American, I mean, the King James translates it. And after the fire, there was what? a still, small voice. And so this works and becomes a kind of part of the vocabulary of Christians to talk about those times when God is speaking, but, but it's, in a, it's a more quiet and subtle way. And this one phrase can take in a wide variety of how God speaks to us. Sometimes it can be in literal words, but inside of our mind or spirit. Sometimes it can be through putting his thoughts and ideas into our thoughts. Sometimes it can be what I like to call and describe later a spiritual download. 
But what I want to do today is just kind of highlight these three different ways that God speaks to us all under the category of a still, small voice to help us understand uh, uh, how God speaks. And what we're going to see is this is actually probably the most important way that we learn to hear from God, that we may have times of dreams and visions or prophetic words, but these are not necessarily the norm, all right? And so there in your note sheet, you have a section called Hearing God, Discerning the Voice, and let's jump in. Let's talk about these three different ways. So the first, the first category that I put under, um, under this, under this uh, heading of the still small voice is what I would call the inner voice, all right? That inner voice. So in other words, that that God can speak to us sometimes with words. He can speak to us with phrases. He can speak to us with sentences or several sentences, Um, but they're not external. Like if if God was speaking to you with the inner voice, you'd be hearing, I would not be hearing. It's not not for the audible ear. Now, I, I believe that this is often how God spoke to the prophets and many times in the Bible when we're told that God would speak to someone, that this is how he spoke. And when you come to the Bible, it's often hard to nail this down because it doesn't say, it just says the Lord said, but it doesn't say like how he said it. But I want to give you an example that seems really clear, one, one experience in the life of Ezekiel that I think was probably representative of how the word of the Lord would come to him. And the passage is in Ezekiel 20, and the situation, the scene is that Israel has been captured and they've taken into Babylon, they're in in exile. Ezekiel is their prophet there. And on one occasion, the prophet, um, I mean, the the elders, the the leaders of the nation, the elders of the nation, they come to uh, to Ezekiel and they wanna ask him if the Lord has a word for them, get some direction for their life. And so this, so this, as we pick it up, it says, so some of the elders of Israel came to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. They're looking for a direction uh, for their, their nation. And they sat down in front of me. So I want you to picture this. They're, they're sitting, uh, Ezekiel's there. They're all sitting together in a circle. And they're, and they're, hey, we want you to inquire of the Lord for us. And so he says, okay. And he says, then the word of the Lord came to me. So while they're all sitting there, it comes. But notice what the Lord says. He says, son of man, which is what the Lord usually calls Ezekiel, like human being, in other words. Uh, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them. So you would have, like the, the word of the Lord's coming, the Lord's speaking to Ezekiel, but it's happening while they're all sitting. They're not hearing this. If they're all hearing this, the Lord doesn't need to speak to them for me. I mean, they would all be hearing it. And so this is an example, and I truly believe that I think this is the, probably the most common way that God spoke to people uh, that we see in the Bible. That he would speak in words, in sentences, and phrases, but but that uh, they're on the inner voice. And so it's like I said, hard to tell, but for example, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 10, where Peter has this vision, and he's on the rooftop praying, he's trying to figure it out. Uh, it says, while he's trying to figure out, the Holy Spirit said to him, go downstairs, or some men downstairs, go with them, I've sent them. Now it doesn't say whether it was audible or not, my hunch is it's internal. Uh, we'll see in our life group this week, you can see what you think, but there's a situation where one of the, the leaders of the early church named Philip, uh, he, he's standing out in the desert and the Lord and the Holy Spirit says to him, uh, run up by that chariot and stand by it. Right? And so you can see what you think, but my opinion is, is that, it's, that this is probably more often than not internal. And so one of the ways that God can speak to us in this still small voice is through words, through phrases, through sentences, but but not audibly outside, but we're just hearing this in our heart, in our spirit, in our brain. But you could write them down, you'd have them exactly down. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure that some of you have experienced this. Um, I know that uh, this is not, by the way, how the Lord typically speaks to me. This is not my experience. But this is a common experience or a way the Lord often speaks to my wife. And this has been a great gift to us, uh, both in our, just our life in general, but at times also in in our ministry together. Like, let me give you an example. Um, This uh, this April uh, will be, Lynn's my 19th anniversary at Rocky Peaks. I mean, 19 years, right? So if you go back to the beginning, the first three years were a little bit rocky, um, no pun intended, uh, just as like, I should have known. 
you're going to the church at Rocky Peak, right? Like, oh, that sounds really cool. Well, anyway. Um, but the, they were years of change. And one of the things I learned is that when, when, you, when you bring a new uh, like lead pastor in from the outside, no matter what, how much you're trying to do the right match, it just always changes things, even if you're not trying to change things, which was sort of my story. And, uh, and so we, we'd been here about 15 months, and the church was going through a lot of changes. And one of the changes had to do in the area of worship. And about that time, we had four of our most uh, prominent, visible, popular leaders on staff. So a couple pastors, a couple ministry directors, <coughs> all leave in a period of a month. So the, these leavings had been going on for, behind the scenes for a long time, but they all came to light in a series of about a month. And so the church is, you know, the church is still trying to figure out, Lynn and I, whether we like us or not. Uh, and all of a sudden you have four of the key leaders who are very popular leaving. And so we're, we're sharing how the Lord has been leading them away. But uh, based especially on the history of the church, there's a, a question of, oh, we think you're really forcing them out. And so it was a very difficult time. And frankly, it's like, Lynn, I, I, I'm wondering, it's like, are we going to make it through this storm? There's a storm gathering here. And so in the midst of that, one of the most popular, one of those four pastors who left was our worship arts pastor. And we had a huge worship arts department then. And so this was creating a lot of, a lot of angst, a lot of, a lot of, in the congregation, and especially in the volunteers and the worship arts world, which were about 200 at that time. And so there was questions about, hey, uh, is the worship style gonna continue to change? Uh, spoiler alert, yes. Um, right. uh, are we still gonna have a choir? Uh, spoiler alert, no. Um, are we, uh, are, are these large productions that have kind of, kind of put us on the map in this area, are they gonna continue? You know, no. Now we didn't know all those answers at that time. We honestly didn't know, but, but it was a, when he left, it cre- there was like heavy tension going on. And so I felt like the best way to address this was just straightforward, honestly, to meet with uh, the people, especially in the worship arts uh, world. And so, uh, so we invited them over our house, all 200 of them, uh, not on the same night, but uh, we had a series of five nights, like five nights where they could come and we could just share our hearts, share the vision, share the values where, where we were uh, out as an elder board um, and uh, what we knew and what we didn't know. And uh, as you can imagine, people came in a different frame of mind, right? Certain people came with just kind of open to, hey, what's God going to do? Other people really nervous that maybe what they loved and the area they serve is going to change. And then you had some people coming just loaded for bear. I mean, they were angry and they just wanted a shot at me in my own home. And so I, I made sure I had an elder there every night uh, just to call 911 and things got out of control, right? <laughs> so you can kind of sense the tension, right? Like very tense. You're in these angry people coming into your home, right? And so uh, the, before the very first night, um, I was downstairs setting up chairs, doing final things, getting ready. Lynn was upstairs praying. And she comes out about 20 minutes, 30 minutes before people are supposed to arrive. And the Lord had given her like a mental picture, right? Kind of a, 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 like a movie, mental movie, uh, much like with Jeremiah, you know, that, hey, what do you see, Jeremiah? Why well, I see uh, a boiling pot turning away from the north. Uh, what do you see? I see an almond branch. And then the Lord would tell him what it meant. It was kind of like that, but what she saw was that she saw a, an airplane that was in the midst of a tremendous like rain and windstorm. And this airplane was just getting buffeted by the wind. It was going up and down and it looked really treacherous like this thing might, might crash. And then in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit spoke a single word to her. And the word was turbulence. And the moment he spoke it, she knew exactly what he was saying. That yes, we were in for a very bumpy ride, but that this was not gonna end in a crash, that we're gonna make it through. And can I tell you, when, the, when Lynn shared that, it was just a very powerful word for me. 
It was like it just strengthened me and kind of like Joshua, hey, do not be afraid, I'll go with you. It was like one of those, it just gave me strength and I was able to lead with just greater confidence and clarity, able to share the vision, share where where we're going, where are we at, here's what we know, here's what I honestly don't know, we'll just have to seek the Lord together. And, And those were powerful meetings as we began to kind of share a leadership style of, hey, when we have conflict, we're not gonna run, we're not gonna sweep it under the carpet, we're not going to be passive. We're going to move right towards it. We're going to move towards it honestly, and we're going to seek the Lord. That, that our calling is not about my vision. or It's about the Lord's vision. We're seeking him for that together. And it became a very powerful time. In the next six months, uh, were, you know, some of those meetings were rough. They were definitely rough. Um, there was some, definitely some anger there, some you know, hatred, some bitterness there. But we made it through those. And over the next six months, continued to be rough. And then in November, that was in June, in November, about six months later, God brought the perfect leader to lead us into the next stage of our development as a church and to lay the foundation which has become such a part of our powerful worship culture here today. But what I want you to catch was how powerful not only that picture was, but that single word. And so God can speak to us. He can speak to us with, with actual words. In fact, whenever Lynn has a word for our life, I always have her write it down because I don't want to mess it up. It's like, no, you missed the third word. I want to have it there. I'm going to save it in Evernote. I'm going to come back to it, right? And so um, these can be very powerful times. And my guess is some of you have experienced that sort of uh, communication from the Holy Spirit, okay? So that's, that's uh, the still small voice can take that form. A second form that the still small voice can take is what I would call thoughts, ideas, and impressions. I might also write the word checks down. We have a check in your spirit, like, hey, something's not right here, or hey, this is, you need to be on guard here, or something like that. But thoughts, ideas, and impressions that So obviously when we talk about, hey, thoughts and ideas and impressions, it raises the question, well, when I have a thought that I think is from the Lord, how do I know if it's from the Lord? Or how do I know if it's from me? Or how do I know even it's from the enemy? And that's a very important question. And we're gonna take two weeks to do the best I can to answer that question. So next week and the next two weeks, we're gonna be talking about discerning the voice, week one, discerning the voice, week two. But for today, I just wanna il- kind, of, kind of introduce it and illustrate it from scripture of, of kind of how this works. Now, this is a really cool thing because, you know, with, as human beings, if we wanna communicate together, most of the time, we have to use words, don't we? Like, like, I have something I want to communicate to you, so I have, what, I have an idea, I have thoughts, and I want to communicate them to you. But since you can't read my mind in most situations, then I'm going to have to translate those thoughts and ideas into words. And I'm going to have to speak them to you, and then you're going or to write them, and you're going to have to take them in, and then you're going to have to try to interpret my words, and hopefully the The thoughts and ideas that I was sending are the thoughts and ideas that you interpreted. We might have to go back and forth a couple times. And so that's how as human beings we we do that, like because we can't read each other's minds, right, most of the time. And uh, and, and praise God we can't most of the time, right? Anyway, that could be a little awkward. Like, why, what are you thinking about this new dress? (laughs) I'm just, uh, whatever. Anyway. How'd you like that concert? Oh, uh, yeah, boy, that was excellent. Uh, yeah. um, anyway, so, so, but the beautiful thing is with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't have to use words. He can just go thought to thought. And it's actually a much more effective way of communicating. And he can just go thought to thought, like in 1 Corinthians 2, it says that as Christians, we have the mind of Christ, that he can send his thoughts into our thoughts, right? Um, and so this can, this can take on, a, 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 this can look at a couple different ways, but let me give you a couple examples from scripture where this happens. The first example is, happens twice in the book of Nehemiah. It happens in chapter two, it happens in chapter seven. We're just gonna look at chapter two. In chapter two, Nehemiah gets back, he gets to Jerusalem. So you remember that, that Nehemiah 
uh, feels called by God to leave his high-ranking post serving the Persian king to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls because the city is in a mess. And so we're told that, that when he first arrives, he doesn't tell anyone why he's there. He wants to do some reconnaissance on the condition of the walls before he casts the vision. And so in that setting, he says in chapter two, there in your note sheet, He says, I set out during the night. In other words, when he first arrived, he wants to check out the walls. I set out during the night with a few others. And catch what he says. I had not told anyone what God had what? Put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. He'll use that same phrase in chapter 7 in, in regards to a different, a different issue in the city. Twice he says, that, that God put something in my heart. So what does he mean? Well, it seems that what happened is when he was first back in Persia, he gets this negative report uh, that the city of Jerusalem's a mess, that he's heartbroken over that, and he begins to fast and pray. In fact, if you do the math, he fasts and prays for months before he goes to the king. And over that time, as he fasts and prays that God would do something, God begins to release a dream. He begins to release a vision. He begins to have thoughts. What he didn't know, I don't think they had these at the beginning. And, and this idea comes that he is just supposed to go back. That he's the one to rebuild the walls. Probably something he never thought of in the beginning. But as he fasts and he prays about this, the more these begins, I, I don't think this is just my, this is like God's idea. Like God is calling. And so this is the way he describes it. He says that God put it in my heart. He recognizes that this whole vision, this whole plan is not from him. It wasn't his idea that God put it in his heart. It's God's thoughts going into his thoughts. A second example is in Psalm 16, fascinating passage, where David writes, this is King David, he says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night my heart instructs me. So David says in his role as a king, as he's leading this nation, that the Lord counsels him. You say, well, how does he do that? Well, sometimes, of course, he'll send a prophet or sometimes there'll be other ways. But he says, I recognize this phenomena that sometimes at night, the Lord's counseling me, but it's not coming through words. It's like thoughts are coming from my own heart, but I recognize they're not from me. They're from the Lord. And so one of the ways that God speaks to us is by his thoughts into our thoughts. And um, Dallas Willard talks about this in the chapter. We'll be reading certain selections from this chapter uh, on the still small voice in our life group this week. But you look what he says. He says, the final means through which God addresses us. So earlier in the chapter, he talked about many different ways, how he, through scripture, through dreams, through visions, through prophetic words, things like that, right? But he says that the final means through which God addresses us is in our own spirits, and then underline this, our own thoughts and feelings towards ourselves as well as towards events like with Nehemiah and with people around us. And catch this, he says, this I believe is the primary subjective way in which God addresses us. Catch that. So the primary objective way would be through his written word. Is that the primary subjective way is through speaking to us through our own thoughts. And he says, in this way, we're addressed by him, spoken to by him through our own thoughts. Right? And so this is the second way. A uh, third way that God speaks to us, and this third way is actually sort of a subset of number two, but I'll explain why I'm separating them out, is the third way that God speaks through the still small voice is through what I'm calling spiritual downloads. So this, this is similar to number two. There's actually overlap, but I'm gonna distinguish them because often when God puts a thought into our mind, um, an impression comes, it's about something that we're supposed to do like right away. It's a limited, it's like specific instruction for a specific situation. Like for example, let's say that you're praying um, and a particular person keeps coming to mind. You're not even thinking about it, but they keep coming to mind. And you're just like, pretty soon you're like, maybe I'm supposed to call them. It just feels like the Lord's putting this on mind. And you call them and they say, I can't believe that you called right now, right? Because here's what I'm going through. 
Um, I had a situation like this uh, when Joel Inyart, Joel and Christy Inyart were in Northern California and they'd called me to kind of work through some of the things that are going on. Uh, through up there, and we had the long conversation. It's a couple months later. I hadn't checked in with them to see how they're doing, and it was a Tuesday. And uh, I thought I wasn't teaching that week, so I had a little extra time. And I said, I'm going to, hey, maybe I'll call Joel and just see how things are going. And I definitely felt the Holy Spirit just put a check, like, nope. All right. Okay. I won't, right? So I forget about it. I go to that Friday. I'm spending time with God at Starbucks, and all of a sudden, I just felt the Holy Spirit's like, now's the time. Call Joel. All right. So I called Joel. And he says, I can't believe you're calling me. I'm like, well, why? He said, well, we're at a crisis point in our, uh, in our relationship up here at our church. And he said, last night, I just called out to God and said, God, that I, I really want to trust you for this. You either have to call us to stay and empower us or call us away. But I'm not going to do anything to make it happen on my own, not even call Michael Yearly. <laughs> And so I call him in the morning, and you know what he said? He said, I don't know if anything will come of this, but he said, I can't tell you how much. It means, like God, it's not forgotten us. Right. Right. And I'm sure you've had those times. And so often when God gives us a thought, an impression, a nudge, um, that it's, it's just small, and it's just for the, for the moment, right? It's just, just call this person or do this or whatever. But there's other times when God speaks and it's like he puts his thoughts in our thoughts and it's bigger, it's richer, it's deeper. It has more implications for our life. I like to call it a spiritual download because you know what it's like when you're downloading a song or you're downloading a video or you're downloading a document. It just takes a second, but it's all there. It's full of content. It's like full of content. And this is how, one of the ways that God often speaks to me is that I'll be in a situation and out of the blue, it's usually out of the blue, just boom, something comes and I can fully articulate it, but it didn't come in words. It just came as a package. Like, let me give you a couple of illustrations. Uh, one from leadership and the one from just our own walk with Jesus. But uh, let's go back to uh, the spring of 2020. We've got some trauma counselors available after the service. <laughs> so we this time. But in 2020, we had that phenomena, which goes by the name, which will not be named. <laughs> Starts with a C, ends in a D. It's not an investment. Um, anyway, um, you, you remember when that happened, like how that hit so hard, it hit in March, remember? And, and remember, we're watching on CNN over in Italy, their health systems over, people are dying. There's these uh, big uh, predictions about this big death rate that's going to hit our country. No one knows what's going to happen. And so I think it was in like the end of March, somewhere in March, I, I think that in our, in our state, like everything got shut down. Any, any kind of gathering of any size got shut down, churches included. And and so we went, you know, we went straight and started streaming online. But you remember in, in about May, there were some churches that were feeling like, hey, we, we need to open up again. We don't care what the government says. And so we're going to open up. And so it kind of became this ruckus of what's the right response. And for us here, as we prayed about it, for us, it wasn't really an issue of, of, of uh, obeying uh, the human government. Um, we, we felt, we, we decided not to open up, but that wasn't the drive, the motivating force. Because later on, the, 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 you know, they, the government would say, you can't meet in homes. And we'd say, forget it. We need, we need to meet. The church needs to meet. It doesn't need to meet in a big building. None of the, the early churches didn't meet in big buildings. They didn't own build buildings. But we need to be meeting in homes. And so we're, we're going we're gonna to meet, right? So it wasn't really an issue of that. As we were praying through as a leadership team, well, what, how should we respond? Should we meet? Should we not meet? Um, there were kind of the three W's that were guiding us. Number one is, what does the word say? Number two is, what does wisdom say? And number three, what does witness say? What's the most effective way to advance the gospel of Jesus with non-believers in this time of national crisis, right? And so as a result of that, we felt like God wasn't calling us to come back to meet together on the early summer. But as, time, as the summer was going on, it was getting increasingly, um, there was, there was, you, you may remember there was a little conflict during that time, 
Does anyone remember that? Few, just a couple different opinions, you know. Um, and so there was, it was just a time of high conflict and as kind of a, the lead pastor here, kind of leading the charge, like I was going before, what, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to, to meet inside? Do you want us to uh, meet outside? Like what, what should we do? And I kept sensing as I was praying in July, he's just saying, just trust me and wait. Trust me, wait. Trust me, wait. How many of you like waiting on the Lord in a crisis? It's like, oh good, I don't have to do anything, I just wait. It's like, right, so I'm like, are you sure? Just wait. <laughs> Lord, uh, any, uh, anything new? Uh, just wait. And then one day I was, at, I was outside of Starbucks. Starbucks wasn't open. <laughs> but I would still go with my blankets. <laughs> Look like the homeless guy there. Hey, didn't you used to be a pastor? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And out of the blue, out of the blue, had not been thinking about what, out of the blue, it came, boom. Like in a flash, a plan I'd never considered, didn't list pros and cons, but it came in a flash. We were to come back hard in August. We were gonna have 12 uh, prayer and worship nights where we had community, where we worshiped where we prayed and we asked God as a church for his direction for the future. And a lot of you were here then. You remember how powerful those were. We met right here in the patio. And it was just a beautiful time of, of fellowship. And, but what happened is that came in a flash. And I called Lauren Laporta, who's our director of, of worship. I called their executive, Pastor Tony, and said, hey, can we meet in half an hour? I feel like the Lord has given us what to do. And so I said, hey, this is what I'm feeling he's called us to do. Is that even possible to meet that many times? And they said, yeah, we can do that. And within a week or two, whatever it was, we had announced it and we came back hard. And by the end of August, we had clarity. Like as we moved into September, yeah, we're to come back hard, not inside, but outside all of our ministries. And we're gonna start meeting outdoors on the weekend. And for those of you who are here, you remember how special those times were. They were often hard. I remember baptizing people in the light rain. Some of you were there. We was like, wow, this is so awesome. We're sprinkling and dunking at the same time. It's like, hey, we're like Presbyterian and Baptist at the same time. This is like awesome, you know. Uh, but it all came in a flash. Another example from our own personal life is that when Lynn and I were young, we were just kind of these radical Jesus kids, you know, radical Jesus, you know, people. And, and so we were in our young 20s. We just graduated from, um, from uh, college. Uh, I, I think I was, I was 23. We, we'd moved back to San Diego County, which is where we're from. And we'd moved back. I was 23. Lynn's a little older. But anyway, um, <laughs> so, sorry, Lynn, just kidding. Uh, I didn't say how much old. Um, anyway, we're, we're young. We're just starting out in our careers. You know, she's a brand new, I was teaching in a Christian school and remember, I'm not a pastor at this point. Don't plan to be a pastor at this point. Don't want to be a pastor at this point. God, don't make me a pastor at this point. Anyway, <laughs> no, that's not really true. Uh, but I wasn't, I, and so we're, we're just not making much money, but uh, during college, we had never really plugged into a church, just because it was just, I won't go into all that, but we, never, we attended churches, but not really plugged in, but now that we're back, we had started going to this small little church, 150 people meeting in a high school cafeteria, and, and, we, and we felt, and it just felt like the time was coming to go before the Lord and say, hey, I, we don't have much money, but like, we want to be kingdom faithful, like, how, how, how much should we give to God's kingdom? like to support this church and so on. And so um, Lynn and I came from very different backgrounds. Like she grew up in a non-Christian home. They went to church Christmas and Easter. Her dad would drop, drop five bucks in the offering plate and call it good for the year, right? I came from a, a home that deeply believed in the tithe, kind of what God taught Israel, 10% of your income off the top, pre-tax dollars, right? Off the top. Uh, and, and, and this was practiced. It was a deep value. And so we also knew that among Christians, there was differences of opinion about, um, about how you should decide how much to give to the kingdom, that some Christians, probably, mo probably most Christians, uh, believe that the tithe that God required of Israel that started long before the law with Abraham uh, goes through a lot that Jesus praises in Matthew 23 that, that as followers of Jesus, we should do that as well, 10% off the top. But we also knew there was a minority opinion 
that, of Christians who said, no, that, that's kind of part of the Old Testament law. We're not under that law, but we have the Holy Spirit, so we should give uh, as the Lord leads us, as the Spirit leads us. And uh, although most of those people would probably say that, but as we give, we might start with less, but over time, we'll probably end up giving at least 10%, maybe more, because it doesn't make any sense that if God would require this level of generosity with Israel, that now that Jesus has come, died for us, we have the Holy Spirit, we'd be less generous than Israel. So they kind of ended up at similar places, but, but we're, we're, we're just at where do we start? And we were honestly willing to go either way. You know, we, were, we just wanted to do whatever Jesus wanted. And remember what I said, this is so important as we go through this series, if you want to hear from God, you have to be willing to do whatever he says. God speaks to us when we're ready to listen. He usually doesn't speak when we're only listening for one thing. Right? And so that's where we were at. And so we've been, I've been praying about this for a couple weeks. And all of a sudden one day, I have this just spiritual download. And it just comes in a flash. It's like as if there was a conversation with Jesus and I that I didn't know we'd had. And it went like this. The conversation went like this. Michael, is this your, is this your, uh, is this your church home? Remember, we're just part of this new little church. Is this your church home? Yes, Lord, it is. Is this a place where you and Lynn plan to come and, and to grow together as my followers? Yes, Lord, it is. Is this a place you hope to one day raise your kids to know me? We didn't have any children at the time. He's like, yes, Lord, it is. And then he asked me this incredibly profound question. And one of the things we'll talk about this, we talk about discerning the Lord's voice, but often when the Lord speaks, he uses very creative language. And he asked me this question, and there wasn't a hint of reproach. It was a powerful question. And he said, well, then why would you let other people pick up the tab for your spiritual growth? And as a young man, I went, wow. Like, I had never thought of that. That, like, the way the kingdom expands is when all of us do our part. And what I was doing was we were going to a church. We were growing. We were being fed. There's a pastor. There's a community there. And yet, we were just freeloading, essentially. It was like we were treating us like Costco, and we're getting the free, you know, the free... <laughs> Free stuff, you know. Uh, and it was a powerful moment. And in that moment, I knew what he was calling us to do. Not calling everyone to do, because I think he leads different people different ways in this area. But for us, I knew it was 10% off the top, full time, pre tax, and that he would add on to that as we went. Amen. Right? Right? Can I tell you, it was one of the most important spiritual decisions in our life. Because what does Jesus say? No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God in money. And this is a test. It's a spiritual test. Every one of us has to go through at some point. Who is God? Is God God or is our, our bank account God? And can I tell you, it was one of the most powerful moments in my spiritual life. And, and for Lynn and I, we just began to do that. And, and it's such a powerful discipline in our life. And as the year has gone on, he's added, okay, let's add this, let's add that. I believe he's blessed us richly as a result of that. We've seen his faithfulness. It's, it's one of the most important spiritual disciplines in my life. Like, don't try to take my, di my tithe. Uh, don't take my Bible. Don't take my tithe, right? It's like, no, no, no. It's almost like a fear of the Lord there. It's like I, I would not dare mess with that and move myself outside of the blessing of God, what he's called us to do, right? Now, like I said, with your life, he may call you differently to start that journey. That's not the point. The point is that's an example of a spiritual download, something that comes. And it's not just like, hey, call Joel. It's like has bigger ramifications, for your entire life or the whole ministry or whatever it is. So, so these are three different ways. I think we try to break down the still small voice, uh, inner voice, real words, but inside your head, uh, ideas, thoughts, impressions, even a check, right? Like so, so say you're, you're single, you're starting, you're looking at someone to date. Just pay attention. 
How's your spirit with that, right? Sometimes the Holy Spirit's just giving you a check. I know he has a job, but no. Huh? Huh? Or he's going to come in these times of spiritual downloads. Now, next week, we'll come back and we'll talk more about, well, how do we discern when, when these thoughts or a voice or these uh, impressions are from the Lord. But today I want to wrap it up with one important question. Uh, before we do that, just notice this, as, as Dallas kind of, uh, we'll talk about this, you may read this week in your, your life group study, but he talks about this, the, you know, the role that the, the still small voice plays in our life, and he says, God addresses us in various ways, and he lists some of those ways, dreams, visions, voices, through the Bible, and extraordinary events, and so forth. He says, each way that God communicates with us has its own special uses. But all the ways are not equally significant for our life or our relationship with him. And from among the individual's experiences of hearing God, the still, small voice has a vastly greater role than anything else. A major point in this book is that the still, small voice or the interior or inner voice, and remember he he defined that with thoughts and feelings earlier as well, as it's called, is the preferred and the most valuable form of individual communication for God's purposes, right? Okay, so that leads to a question. So here's a question, a simple question. I want you to reflect on it this week, is how have you experienced the still small voice. How have you experienced the still small voice? Now, my guess is in that a group, in a congregation as large as this, those of you joining us online, that we probably have a wide range of experiences. And as I've described some of these experiences, that for some of you say, oh, I've experienced that. No, I haven't experienced that. Um, there, there, but there also may be some of you that might say, I don't know if I've experienced any of those things. And I just want to encourage you that, um, that that's not abnormal. Um, I think that, that the, one of the reasons we're doing this series is to try to break this down so we begin to recognize when God is speaking. Because the reality is, is that often God is speaking, as we've talked about earlier in the series, and we just haven't learned to recognize it. In a couple of weeks, I'll be sharing uh, something from my own life that the very first time that God spoke to me in a very specific personal way through scripture was very powerful, but I didn't recognize for three years that it was the Lord. And I think this is, this is not uncommon, that sometimes that we can have, so, so what, here's, here's my guess, that for some of you, that there may have been times in your Lord when the Holy Spirit has spoken a word, a literal word, or a voice, or something, and and you just have forgotten about that, or you've never shared it with anyone for fear that um, that they they might think you're crazy or something. Uh, There might be uh, others of us that as we talk about how God speaks in our thoughts, how he speaks in our ideas, impressions, that even as we're talking, you begin to remember like, hmm, I may have experienced that. That sounds familiar. Um, we talk about spiritual downloads. Maybe some of you, you had to make a major decision. Like, like I remember when I was in, college, uh, in high school, I was preparing to go to college. I was all matriculated, accepted at a particular school. And through a series of events, I ended up at a completely different school. And to this day, I can't explain how that happened. But looking back, I know. It's like God was putting his thoughts in my thoughts. I can recognize it now, but at the time... I, it was almost like a mystery how I ended up, you know. We'll be talking more about that. But what I want to, I, I want to ask, I want you to be asking, how, is, how have you experienced this? And I want to encourage you that this week in your time alone with God and as you go through your life groups, to be asking the Lord, are there times in my life when you have been speaking, I just haven't recognized it, or I don't remember it? And would you, would you bring those back to mind? And then as we gather in our life groups this week, I want to encourage you like to share honestly from your heart those times where you feel like God was speaking or might have been speaking. And it's fine to say, I'm not sure, but there was this one time I think he may have been. I'm still trying to figure it out. That's fine. You know, in the New Testament, it says that as a church that we should be teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. 
I don't know if you remember when J.P. Moreland was here this summer, the philosopher from Biola, and he spoke in our apologetics series. Many of you were here. That he, he was talking about miracles and how many times God does miracles in our lives, but we're just slow to share them for fear that others would not understand or not believe. But how powerful it is when we share what God is doing. And so I want to encourage you in our life groups this week that, that you would be open if the Holy Spirit's kind of nudging you to share what he's doing in your life so that we can learn and grow together. Amen? And then we're going to come back next week and we're going to begin to talk about, well, how do we discern when there's a voice, when a impression, uh, when a thought, when a download, like how do we discern when it's from the Lord, uh, when it's from ourselves, and when it's from the enemy? And I'm sure we won't answer all questions because this there's a, uh, there's a mystery to some of this, right? Like, how do you describe to someone else when you're in love? It, like, it's kind of hard. It's like, it's a little squishy, right? But we're going to do the best we can to kind of say, here's, here's, some, here's like six questions you can ask. We'll do two next week and four the next week, because we're doing baptisms next week, too. So, uh, so yeah, I know, exciting, right? So, so we're getting excited about that. So, so next week, we'll, six, we'll start six questions that you can ask and you're trying to discern. Does that sound good? That's it. Let's pray together. So Father, we just thank you so much for being a living God who speaks. And Jesus, you said that when you left, that you were not leaving us as orphans, that you were going to send another counselor. Um, you were the first, another parakletos, another comforter, another mentor, another leader, and that one of his jobs was to, to lead us into all truth. And so, Lord, we pray that even as we, we sing this final song and we, we just pr- sing it as a prayer, that you would, the Holy Spirit would rest on us in, in new ways. We pray, Lord, that we would be a church ready to listen and follow, that we would be the kind of people that you are willing to speak to because we really want to hear, not to use it, not to manipulate you, not to further our agenda, but to truly grow in our knowledge of you and our love for you and our ability to please you and to bring your kingdom on earth and accomplish your will and not our own. We pray that you'd meet us now as we worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen.